From humanity's beginning, we have always tried to comprehend the natural world. It is all around us, and in fact, we are it. The modern disciplines of chemistry, physics and biology are the latest result in our never-ending trial to build, create and control these natural powers. But there was a great precursor to the sciences, an esoteric distortion of religion, spirituality and logic that we know as alchemy. For hundreds of years, alchemists were at the forefront of experimentation and innovation. The general aim of alchemy was to use or harness natural energy to change or warp reality. Not only did this lay the groundwork for basic chemistry, but it sent every scholar, philosopher and apothecary on a wild quest to discover ancient wonders like the transmutation of metals and the creation of the red stone of knowledge. Every European king would have a flock of these alchemists at their disposal, running tests and experiments in the hope of creating eternal life or infinite wealth. Today, our story takes us to the court of King James IV of Scotland. There we will find the alchemist, who would one day be known as the Birdman of Stirling Castle. Our story begins late in 15th century Italy, with a young man by the name of John Damien de Falcus. Being born in the heart of the Renaissance, to a family of some wealth, gave John many options in life. He would begin by becoming a student of religion and learning of the powers of God. After some years, the young cleric wished to advance his knowledge, and so travelled to France, where he would study medicine. It was here that John would discover a great passion for engineering, but also experimental alchemy. With his studies finished, John, like most modern scientists, now required funding to continue his experiments and further his studies into alchemy. First he appealed to the French royal court, which allowed him the supplies and equipment to produce powerful medical elixirs. Unfortunately, de Falcus would fail at this task, not only losing his funding, but also much of his standing in France. It was after this disgrace, the alchemical novice would leave mainland Europe and head to the court of King James IV of Scotland. John would arrive in Scotland in 1501 and was swiftly employed as the court physician. It would seem that King James had seen something in the young Italian and was much interested by his medical proficiency. John rose in reputation with surprising quickness, mostly due to the king's favour, but this would also incur the mistrust and jealousy of many others at court, who would call the man the French leech. Leech in those days was a non-flattering term for physician or medical professional. It didn't take long before the conversations between John and the king turned to experimental alchemy another subject of great interest to James IV. It was then the king would decide to fund John's alchemical studies far beyond the man's wildest dreams. And in 1503, John was tasked by the king to make the quintessence. The quintessence, also known as ether, or the fifth element, was believed to be the material that fills the region of the universe beyond the terrestrial sphere. The element outside the confines of the four, fire, water, earth and air. Some claimed ether was the material that created the heavenly bodies of the sun and the stars. Producing this substance on earth was said to be near impossible, yet if it could be done and it could be contained, it would produce an elixir said by many alchemists to grant everlasting life. John was granted an unfathomable amount of gold, and with it 
he would create the great alchemical furnaces in both Stirling Castle and Holyrood House. The king would also supply hundreds of rare and expensive ingredients, along with putting his court apothecary, John Moseman, under the command of Defalcus. A goldsmith named Matthew Auchinleck would be hired to create the many silver fittings needed for the distillation equipment. The alchemist would spend every waking second in the hunt for the quintessence. Rumours spread throughout Scotland of an Italian cleric who was said to produce the mythological fifth element and would do so for the king. Later that year, and for what the king believed was significant advances in the possible creation of ether, he granted to Falcus the powerful position of Abbot of Tongland which again granted the man an impressive amount of influence in the Scottish royal court. John would now take part in the discussions and judgments of the court, while continuing his search for the quintessence. But this, ironically, is where John's great rise begins to dip. Sometime around 1506, it was decided by both the king and John that he had failed in his task, and although he believed to have furthered the alchemical study of ether, it was beyond his powers. Yet this was far from his end. He now promised the king that he would solve the mystery of transmutation and turn lead to gold, a feat that would make Scotland the most powerful kingdom in the world. Again with the king's backing, the furnaces were lit and the great alchemist and his now many subordinates began work. After another year had passed, Defalcus once again had failed to produce anything of note. Due to his continued failures, John's favour at court and with the king had begun to wane, but not disappear entirely. John now returned to the king with his next great idea. One he said had no chance of failure. It was something he had thought about for years, and now, as a master of the four elements, John would be the first man to fly. John became obsessed with his new plan, and for reasons unknown to me, the king once again funded this experiment. DeFalcus began observing birds, and in specific their movement. After some months, he determined that the ability of flight came from the birds' wings, and how they controlled and funneled the element of air. Therefore, John concluded that flight was actually quite simple. All one required was feathers. In the following weeks, the king's best engineers would build a feathered flying rig to John's detailed specifications. One of the most difficult parts of this was finding thousands of eagle feathers to attach to the frame. DeFalcus had specified that it had to be eagle feathers and that no other plumage would suffice. Eventually, the day came where the great alchemist John Damien de Falcus would attempt to fly. He first informed the king that his flight would only be a short one, and only for test purposes. So he agreed that the journey from the walls of Stirling Castle over the English Channel to France would be an acceptable first journey. The king and his courtiers would assemble themselves along the 70-foot-high battlements of Stirling Castle. Below them stood hundreds of inquisitive townfolk and travellers, all hoping to see the first flight of the Birdman of Stirling Castle. John, surrounded by fussing engineers, stepped out of the castle and onto the very edge of the battlements, clad in a great winged contraption. As the man stood, gazing down at the ground before him, he took two deep breaths, turned, bowed to the king, and with all confidence leapt out into the air. With his chin held firmly forward, and the wind gusting through his hair, the alchemist fell seventy foot, landing painfully in the ground below him. The birdman's first flight was a complete and utter disaster. John was found battered, bruised, and covered in blood, completely unconscious at the castle's base, yet still alive. He was taken by his own physicians, 
and after two days, he awoke. The man had many cuts and breaks, not to mention severe concussion, but it was his shattered thigh bone that would cause him never to walk with ease again. After this failure, John would resign his title of Abbot of Tongland, and would recede into the background of court life and history. Strangely, the king still had favour for the man, whether it was for his determination and resolve in the field of alchemy, or just out of sheer admiration for his foolish bravery. King James's support would never truly leave DeFalcus. Even after his resignation as abbot, the king would write to Pope Julius II, asking that John's pension of 200 gold ducats be paid to him for service to the church. John's name was still noted in Scottish court records up until 1513, when the great King James was killed by the English at the Battle of Flodden. This has been the odd life of John Damien de Falcus, the Italian cleric, the French leech, the great alchemist of King James, and of course, the birdman of Stirling Castle. Thank you for listening, and a special thank you to my wonderful patrons for supporting the channel and allowing me to bring you these videos. I almost don't know where to start on the appendices to this story, as there is so much. Like all other tales, there is many recorded versions of this story. The one I have given is a mixture of a few different tellings, and is what I believe to be the most enjoyable, and for the most part, historically accurate. There is quite a famous satirical poem, written at the time of John's legendary flight, by the court poet to King James, one William Dunbar, entitled A Ballad of the False Friar of Tongland, How He Fell in the Mire Flying to Turkey. The poem is composed in the form of a dream or vision, and tells the supposed biography of de Falcus. The tone of the poem is derisive and humorous, filled with exaggerated truths and fanciful fiction. It opens with Dunbar himself, waking one morning and accounting that night's dream. It then quickly sets the tone for the remainder of the poem, by telling of how a barbarous Turk, de Falcus, killed an Italian cleric, in order to steal his habit and impersonate him. Eventually, the murderer was uncovered, and so fled to France, where he pretended to be a physician, but having no talent for such, he was forced to flee once more. Now he would land in Scotland and trick the king into making him an abbot. But the new abbot would ignore his religious duties and spend all his time with mad experiments. After the failure of all his alchemical works, the mad murderer would decide to fly back to Turkey with a coat of feathers. As the man takes flight, Many birds in the air decide to attack him, biting, clawing and pecking, snatching away the feathers that were stolen from them. While this happens, the birdman, how do I say this, loses control of his bowels over a particularly unfortunate herd of cattle. Now with all his feathers gone, the foolish man falls into a great midden or pile of muck, where he hides for three days waiting for the birds to leave. At this point, Dunbar is woken by the morning bird song, and the poem ends. So let's begin at the top. There was no evidence that de Falcus came from Turkey, or that he was a murderer. On the other hand, his birth is recorded in Italy, and his study of religion is well documented. His true identity was never uncovered in France, and I suppose it could be argued whether he tricked the king or not. This poem is the only reference to a flight to Turkey, and in all other historical records, France is his stated destination. There is also no evidence of the midden, or the unfortunate incident with the cows. I know this poem could be seen 
a simple comical entertainment for the court. But it seems to me that Dunbar had a vested interest in the manufacture of what I can only describe as an early conspiracy theory designed to defame and harass the Falcus. This was not the only poem attacking the alchemist that Dunbar authored. In another, called The Birth of the Antichrist, he makes mention of a foolish abbot attempting to fly, which is widely regarded to be the Falcus. It's unfortunate just how prevalent the conjecture and lies of Dunbar have come to be. Many references to this historic tale seem to be directly drawn from these poems, and not the vastly more accurate accounts made by the great Scottish historian John Leslie, who recorded much of DeFalcus' story, including his legendary flight. As a quick aside, Leslie once recorded that John believed his feathered machine to have been incorrectly prepared, and that hen feathers had been added to it, ruining the purity of the eagle feathers, and this accounts for the failure. Something I found to be particularly interesting was that the alchemist's attempt at flight was actually re-evaluated only a few years ago by Charles McKean, Professor of Scottish Architectural History at the University of Dundee, who is very well respected in his profession. Charles suggests that through his examination of both the building and the site of de Falcus's attempted flight, he has come to the conclusion that the flight may have worked to some extent, making it a groundbreaking achievement for the time. He suggests that the manner in which the flight has been portrayed as a complete failure is more down to the biased writing and jealousy of his detractors, such as William Dunbar the poet, who is often overlooked by the king and detested the ease by which John rose in the court's favour. Charles further states that to obtain the best uplift for his long journey, John Damien de Falcus flew off the west side of the ramparts. To the repeated scorn of the poet William Dunbar, he landed in a midden and broke his thigh bone. He was ridiculed and the attempt dismissed. Anyone looking over the west parapet of Stirling Castle would realise that someone tumbling down the rock at that point would end up very dead. Moreover, the royal gardens lay at its foot. Although the exact processional route between castle and gardens remains unclear, this was no place for a midden. A 1702 plan of the town, on the other hand, indicates the nearest midden half a mile away, beyond the current Smith Art Gallery. If that was the one in which de Falcus landed, there is but one conclusion. The wings worked. He didn't reach France, of course, but I believe his flight should be regarded as a historic success. While I personally am not entirely sure about Charles McKean's conclusions, they are interesting, and he is by far more educated on the subject than I. I would be interested to know if anyone out there has read of Charles McKean's work or continued to reevaluate the flight of the Birdman. As for DeFalcus himself, many people throughout history have ridiculed his attempted flight and suggested that he was a trickster or conman out to rob the crown under the guise of alchemy. I personally do not believe this to be true. I think DeFalcus truly did believe in his experiments. Even after his failed flight, he continued to work on his alchemical studies and has thought that he created further designs for a flying contraption. In many ways, John Damien de Falcus was mad, but the kind of madness that touches on the side of genius, the kind of madness that pushes scientific theory and philosophy forward, the kind of madness that makes someone become the legendary Birdman of Stirling Castle. Thanks again for listening, and I will see you all next time for more folklore and stories from Scotland. Slán